Okay, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Adam Levine, and I'm director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at the Watson Institute uh, of Brown University. And on behalf of both the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies and the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Jamie Rowan virtually to our Watson Institute uh, here at Brown University for what should be a really excellent presentation. I'm just gonna begin by introducing Dr. Rowan. Uh, before I do so, I just want to give uh, some general logistics and information about how this webinar format will work. So uh, we have uh, a number of attendees, which is very exciting. What I'll do is first introduce uh, Dr. Rowan and then give her a chance to give her uh, presentation and remarks. And then afterwards, we will take questions from all of the attendees. In the meantime, we've started by muting all of the attendees. Um, when it comes time for questions, uh, you can either uh, virtually raise your hand, so mark the raise my hand button, and then we will call on you to ask your question. Uh, or if you prefer, you can type your question into the Q&A uh, box, and then we'll read your question out loud. So you can do it either way. Um, and we should have a really interesting and uh, deep discussion today on this topic. So first, uh, let me introduce Dr. Rowan. Uh, Dr. Rowan is an Associate Professor of Legal Studies and Political Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where her research focuses on law and society, transitional justice, international criminal law, social movements, and international comparative methods. Her research is centered on the use of law to redress mass atrocity and aid vulnerable groups. Dr. Rowan's current projects examine the confluence of domestic immigration and international criminal law within the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the purpose and practice of veteran treatment courts. Dr. Rowan's recent book, Searching for Truth in the Transitional Justice Movement, focuses on the emergence of transitional justice as an idea in international and domestic scholarship, policymaking, and advocacy. In the book, she examines efforts to make truth commissions in the Balkans, Colombia, and the United States. Over the past decades, Dr. Rowan has studied religion and post-conflict justice in Vietnam, developed life skills educational programs for orphans and vulnerable children, in South Africa and the Balkans, studied refugee health in Morocco, and examined human rights protections in Latin America with the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights. She received a JD from Berkeley School of Law in 2009, a PhD from the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program at the Berkeley School of Law in 2012. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rowan uh, for this webinar here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Levine. It's a it's a privilege to be here. We we were discussing, you know, the timing of all of this, um, but I know that a lot of us are trying to also focus on our work and other really important topics. Um, so it's a privilege to share this work in progress. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you um, uh, as we go through the slideshow. Let me just talk a little bit about uh, how I became interested in this topic. Um, I've been working in the Balkans for quite some time, since 2000. Um, and one of the things I learned from working in the Balkans is that there is a lot of complexity about this conflict and who is guilty uh, for it. And there's been a lot of dilemmas at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, uh, which is the international court that was trying cases um, and determining which people should be the people that we consider guilty for this violence uh, criminally. And so as I was teaching a class on human rights, I was interested in sort of alternatives to international criminal courts to deal with perpetrators of mass atrocity. And I looked for efforts that I knew were going on in Canada when I taught at, at the University of Toronto to see if the United States had a similar effort, which was basically to use immigration law uh, to find and um, in some sense punish perpetrators of mass atrocity, right? And the idea is it's not criminal punishment that we're looking for necessarily, but we're looking for people who may have made their way to the United States and are perpetrators of mass atrocity. We're not trying them necessarily, 
um, for those atrocities, but we're figuring out ways to either prevent them from coming in or once they're here, make them leave. And sure enough, I saw this New York Times article about the effort to deport Bosnians. And that got me thinking about which Bosnians uh, this, uh, this effort was going towards um, and what are some of the complexities of using immigration law uh, to target Bosnians. So there's an opportunity here because not everybody can be punished by international courts, but there's also a challenge because of the complexity of uh, mass atrocity in terms of who's guilty and who's not for committing acts of violence. So this led me as a scholar of international criminal law, as Professor Levine mentioned, I write about truth commissions and the opportunities and challenges of that particular mechanism to deal with mass atrocity. And I reached out to a colleague of mine, Rebecca Hamlin, who's a scholar of the immigration bureaucracy in the United States. And together we started to look at how this particular policy of deporting suspected human rights violators and war criminals was being put into effect. More recently, we've been interested in public opinion on that particular issue. And so we enlisted the support of a colleague of ours, Scott Blinder, who's a public opinion scholar on immigration. So together, um, we've been doing different parts of this, of this research. Um, today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the theoretical background that we bring as socio-legal scholars. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the domestic implementation challenges juxtaposing the types of perpetrators uh, that uh, are being targeted. Um, we're gonna talk, then I'm gonna pivot um, to newer work that we've done, which is looking at not just the United States, but how other countries have engaged in similar work. Um, and then these newer projects on public opinion data. Now the takeaway is, uh, determining who should be deported is not as easy as it may first seem. So again, while this is a, can be a wonderful opportunity to ensure justice for mass atrocities, and that's usually how it's talked about in um, the international criminal law literature, there's also some trade-offs in thinking about using immigration law to enforce human rights. Um, and one of those reasons, one reason for that is because this politics of no safe haven is tied up with politics of not in my backyard. Um, so this idea of national security really that gets mixed with um, making sure that human rights violators do not end up uh, finding refuge in the United States. So I'm gonna outline a little bit of that. So the theory that we're interested in is sort of the way in which immigration law and uh, criminal law have come to be blended um, in this new uh, effort. And that's a well-established uh, theoretical perspective. It's often called crimigration. Um, and the idea is that by blending immigration law and criminal law, there's a, a dragnet effect where people become especially vulnerable uh, to our justice processes without the due process protections um, that, might, that might be useful <laughs> to ensure human rights for them. One of the concerns that we bring to this is that now with this politics of no safe haven, um, there's a, a blending of international criminal law. We're bringing in international criminal law and trying to meet those goals um, of making sure that people who committed mass atrocity don't get a uh, haven um, into this already dynamic and fraught crimigration regime. So, why might we need to use immigration law to deal with violence that's as clearly wrong as uh, perpetrating uh, genocide or crimes against humanity uh, or war crimes, which is what uh, the international criminal law regime protects against? Well, the reason we need to use immigration law is because we have very limited laws in our criminal and civil regime. So, the Proxmire Act of 1987 allows for prosecutions of genocide only where an accused was a US national or the genocide took place in the United States. Okay, so the, so the genocide convention that was signed in 1948 was not domesticated into US law until the Proxmire Act. Now, obviously this is very limiting. Not, it's not easy to prove that a, it's, 
we don't think of U.S. citizens committing genocide, and that's not typically um, what uh, the international criminal focus is on, nor are there genocides necessarily in the United States that are contemporary, um, uh, which would be needed to not uh, be to, to meet this 1987 implementation, right? Not before 1987. So in 2006, the Genocide Accountability Act amended the Proxmire Act to allow anyone in the United States to be charged with genocide, even if the perpetrator was not a US citizen. However, to date, no one's been charged under this act. And one of the reasons is the US courts would likely struggle, just as international courts have struggled, to determine what violence qualifies as a genocide, um, as well as getting the evidence that would be needed from those countries in order to prove it in a court of law. So another law, the War Crimes Act, uh, which was passed in 1996 to ensure that perpetrators of war crimes against US nationals could be prosecuted, uh, makes it difficult to charge individuals who are not in the military with war crimes. Again, this is an act that domesticates international law, uh, in this case, the genocide conventions. Um, this act was further limited by the Military Commissions Act of 2006. Now, there are US civil statutes that relate to international criminal law, but they are also limited in scope. So the 1992 Torture Victims Protection Act has also rarely been used, partially because of its 10-year statute of limitations, and partly because no one can be tried for atrocities that were committed before 1992. Further, because it provides civil remedies for victims, a conviction under the TVPA does not carry the same moral weight as a criminal conviction. Finally, the Alien Tort Claims Act of 1789 is a historic statute um, that in more recent times, victims and non-governmental organizations have used to bring claims in U.S. courts against perpetrators who committed violations of the law of nations. That was how it was written at the time. But the Supreme Court drastically limited the ability of U.S. courts to punish war criminals and human rights violators with a decision, Kiobel, in 2013. I'm happy to talk more about that. But basically, the takeaway is these laws are very limited. Um, and so those that are interested in pursuing justice against people who have perpetrated mass atrocity or that we might consider responsible for them uh, need to be addressed in a different way. Otherwise, there's going to be an impunity gap. Now, obviously, what comes to mind when we first think about this policy is World War II. So not surprisingly, our efforts to deport suspected human rights violators and war criminals stems from efforts to find Nazis that were residing in the US. And so the Office of Special Investigations was developed in the Department of Justice in 1979 and that group worked exclusively on hunting residents in the U.S. who had been Nazis. And basically all prosecutors had to prove was that the immigrant had been a Nazi. That's written into our immigration codes. Um, but by the 1990s, this unit began to shift its focus towards prosecuting perpetrators of human rights violators in more recent conflicts. And again, has been limited as noted because of our limited laws that allow for this to be done criminally. Now, this case that I have up here shows one of the leading cases about denaturalizing a Nazi. Uh, and it was really a foundational case for figuring out, well, what are some other ways that we might be able to make sure that perpetrators of mass atrocity are not allowed to reside in the United States with immigration benefits? And this case is called Fedorenko. In Fedorenko, it, this, this um, former Nazi uh, guard was tried um, for lying on his immigration forms, and the district court said that he was not deportable because he claimed and had evidence to suggest that this was true, that he was forced to be a guard um, because he was captured by the Germans. He was a, actually a Russian military officer. He was captured by the Germans and then forced. And so they said, well, that is okay. You didn't do, this isn't, this doesn't rise to um, a, an act that would bar you from being eligible for uh, immigration benefits. And on appeal and up to, to the Supreme Court, Fedorenko lost. 
And the court said it doesn't matter if you wanted to work in the camp or not. The fact is that you did and you lied about it. And if you lie about uh, something to an immigration officer and that is negatively, that means that the line of questions that come after are altered and that line of questions might have led to information that found you excludable. Well, now you've made a material misrepresentation in an immigration proceeding that counts as fraud and you now have illegally procured immigration benefits. You're out. So Fedorenko was deported and in fact later killed. Um, and that case really opened the door to using immigration law to find people who may have committed fraud on their immigration forms when they came here. Again, a very useful way of finding perpetrators and making sure they don't receive immigration benefits um, and receive some form of punishment in this broad gap that we have both internationally and domestically with dealing with human rights violators and war criminals. So what ended up happening was this, these efforts to focus on human rights violators and war criminals got an extra boost after 9-11. And this is when um, there was a general convergence of immigration and security in US policymaking. So the, the emergence of this unit, um, and we studied this unit with the generosity of people in it sharing information about it, um, as well as studying uh, different cases that they've pursued, both going and observing court hearings and also talking to lawyers involved. Um, there were a few people that were really instrumental in making sure that uh, a unit dedicated to pursuing suspected war criminal, criminals and human rights violators became part of the US uh, it, bureaucracy. And so um, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, Assistant Secretary, uh, My Mike Garcia, wanted more attention paid to the issue of suspected war criminals after the U.S. created a new unit on transnational crime and public safety. In August 2003, the Human Rights Law Division was created, and this unit was uh, began working with investigative agents in order to identify suspected war criminals in the United States and to work on deporting them. The organization went through several iterations. First, it was the Office of Investigations and then became Homeland Security Investigations. Um, in 2004, Congress passed the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Protection Act. And this added charges of torture and extrajudicial killing to existing immigration law uh, on grounds for removal of admissibility, inadmissibility. So basically the human, uh, this uh, Homeland Security investigations had a new set of laws to enforce its mandate. It could find people um, that maybe committed torture, extrajudicial killing, and make sure that they were either not admitted um, or if they were in the United States, we could figure out ways to get them to leave. In 2008, the head of the Homeland Security Investigations decided to create a pilot version of this Human Rights Violators and War Crimes Center. The pilot program ran for one year and it was made permanent in 2009, okay? So it hired historians to aid in their work to find people who were residing in the U.S. who might have committed atrocities abroad, but made their way into the U.S. fraudulently. In addition to that, this group has made great strides in preventing suspected war criminals and human rights violators from coming to the U.S. by changing the, form, the questions that are asked of people who want to come into the United States. So here is a list of information that, uh, that the US uh, Customs and Immigration Service asks you if you are trying to come into the United States and receive immigration benefits. And if you look down towards the bottom of this list, you'll see uh, there's always been questions to make sure that people were not uh, involved with the Communist Party. There's always a question about your affiliation. But this question about, did you participate in a genocide or persecution because of race, religion, national origin, or political opinion is a really important screening question. 
So if you come from abroad and you were part of a, a mass atrocity, right, you were involved in some way and you're asked this by an immigration official and you say no, and later there's information to suggest, yes, you've committed fraud. And most likely it's a material misrepresentation because if you had said yes to this question, it probably, or, or some variant, it would have led to information that would have made you excludable, right? So this is a, sc this is a screen that makes sure that people don't come here. But what happened for people who came here before this question was asked um, or who lied, right? What do we do once they're here? And this is where um, there's been a concerted effort to make sure that individuals are not allowed to stay. The way that the unit uh, explains its work is they call it the Al Capone method. Um, and the Al Capone method is a way of using both criminal law and immigration law to make sure that these individuals don't stay here. So it is both a crime to commit fraud in an immigration proceeding, and it's also punishable in immigration court, right? Where So you could either be tried in a criminal court for committing fraud, or you could be tried in immigration court. And those have very different standards, right? One is uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. The other is more like evident, more, it, it's a different standard, more likely than not, right? And so it's a lot easier to pursue these cases in immigration court than it is in criminal court. And initial, our, our findings suggest that while there are a lot of people who may have committed fraud, it's harder to prove it in criminal court. And sometimes when the cases don't succeed in criminal court, the uh, people who have been prosecuted get then put into immigration proceedings where the standards are lower and are deported. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these different cases um, and how we should be thinking about them. So um, when we're looking at this effort to use either criminal law, right, to criminally prosecute people for committing fraud or immigration law, what we're really doing is not just asking to deport them because they committed fraud, but there's an influence of international criminal law goals going on here, right? And international law goals related to immigration. So the Refugee Convention, the 1951 Refugee Convention, says you can't be a refugee if you committed a crime against peace or a war crime or a crime against humanity. Um, or if you committed a serious non-political crime. It's called the persecutor bar. And so we're using domestic criminal law and domestic immigration law to enforce this persecutor bar. But this has also been used in some ways in international criminal law. Um, and international criminal law is trying to really get the people who are most responsible for this type of violence, right? They don't usually go for lower level perpetrators, often because it's not clear uh, how we should think of their responsibility. Were they ordered? Um, did what, what level of responsibility do they have for the acts that took place? Um, and we should really only be going after those most responsible. So in some ways, this unit and its efforts are, again, a way to get those lower down. And in some ways, it's a challenge because those people lower down now get associated with this persecutor identity, right, for better or worse. So what does that look like in practice? So I'm going to talk about two different types of cases. The first cases are ones out of uh, that, that focus on individuals in Liberia who were part of that civil war. So the first case that um, made its way uh, into the United States immigration system was a man named George Boley, and he was actually identified by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Liberia as someone who should be prosecuted. So he was living in Buffalo, he had been here for decades, um, and his story is interesting because he left, he actually crossed the border into Canada. He claims it was, he was lured, it's not clear. On his way back, he was, he was detained, um, and they said, actually, given that you've been accused of, um, in this case, it was uh, child soldier, uh, working with child soldiers, um, they said that you uh, are now 
uh, not allowed back in the United States. You are now uh, an alien and we're gonna detain you. And he was brought into immigration proceedings in Buffalo. So despite living in the United States on and off for 40 years, the judge had determined he had abandoned his lawful permanent residence. He was an arriving alien, so he's detained. Um, and they prosecuted him in immigration court. They actually had tried to prosecute him in criminal court, but they had issues uh, with the statute of limitations, um, as well as when the, the, viol the acts that he was accused of had occurred. So this was the first trial under the 2008 Child Soldiers Accountability Act. Uh, it would leave him subject to deportation. Um, he basically self-deported. Uh, he was found guilty and decided not to appeal. Um, and in one of the dilemmas that we see about these efforts using deportation, um, he became a legislator. He's current, he was a congressman uh, in Liberia once he returned, right? So here he's considered a perpetrator. He goes back to Liberia and in some ways evades justice, right? And so that's a real dilemma. The next case is uh, Jabate. So in April 2016, a Liberian citizen, uh, Mohammed Jabate, was arrested in Philadelphia. He had been granted asylum in the United States in 1998. He had become a legal permanent resident in 2011. When he was arrested, and this was somebody in his community in Philadelphia recognized him as what they called Jungle Jabba, the leader of a rebel group. Um, he had participated in the Liberian Civil War. He had allegedly ordered the murder of civilians and prisoners of war and oversaw the abduction and rape of women and the forced conscription of child soldiers. Uh, pretty clear uh, that this man uh, was the rebel leader. And interestingly, um, this was the photo that was used uh, as the very first witness in this trial was the photographer who took this photo, um, which was the evidence that this same person now living in Philadelphia uh, was the person who was a rebel leader in Liberia. So he was charged with two counts of immigration fraud and two counts of perjury for not disclosing his role in this uh, rebel organization. The prosecutor of this particular criminal trial, and this was, again, this was in criminal court. He was tried for criminal uh, fraud for lying on his immigration forms, unlike Boley, who went straight into immigration proceedings. Um, this trial was run quite like an international criminal tribunal. I was an observer at this trial and was, was struck by the emphasis on the violence that occurred and giving voice to the victims. It was an explicit goal by the prosecutor in this case, and this prosecutor happened to be uh, at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So he had experience uh, prosecuting these cases. He took this up um, from this Human Rights Violators and War Crimes Unit and decided to pursue this case in criminal court, a huge expenditure of resources. They flew in witnesses from Liberia, questioned them, and they won. What was interesting about this is they won in a, in a way that suggests that not that we're, the punishment is not just for immigration fraud, but we're saying that we want to punish this person for what they did. And I, I say that because Jabate was given 30 years, a 30 year punishment for immigration fraud. That is a huge sentence for immigration fraud, right? And it makes us think that really what we're doing is punishing him for the underlying offense, right? Which is about his involvement in um, these, this human rights violation, right? So on some level, it's a huge victory for justice, right? If, if he's a rebel commander who engaged in all of the acts that he was accused of, right, to get 30 years. Um, but again, that's for fraud, right? And so what are we saying, you know, if we're using the criminal law to make sure that we understand that what he did in the war was wrong, right? We're using, that sort of becomes, sort of in the background and we're punishing them for the fraud in this major way. So that was a, a really remarkable case for the punishment. Um, and after he is let out, uh, he will be deported because if you commit a crime like that, you are now subject to deportation. Now the next case out of Philadelphia, same set of lawyers, right, used to um, these cases, was woe you. And this was a fascinating case because this was uh, the right hand man of, of Charles Taylor, um, the leader of Liberia during the Civil War. And the United States had 
evidence about his role with the particular organization that he was accused of being part of. So he was actually charged on with 16 counts um, of perjury and misrepresentation. And uh, he, he said throughout his trial, and his defense attorney said throughout his trial, the US knew exactly who this man was and what he was doing. And so when they asked him in his immigration proceedings, were you part of this? They didn't even explicitly ask him, were you part of this organization? They just said, were you part of an organization? Uh, you know, were you a member of any organization? And he didn't disclose the particular organization they were concerned about. So then the, he was charged for that as some type of material misrepresentation. And interestingly, the, he was found not guilty um, on those charges. Uh, the, the court, uh, the jury bought the story of the defense attorney that that, that question, um, he's, he didn't lie. Uh, it wasn't a material misrepresentation because the United States had documentation from 2007 when the State Department interviewed him about his role in that organization. But he was found guilty on 11 of the 16 charges, um, in particular that he had advocated the violent overthrow of a government his defense was, well, the government that I violently wanted to overthrow, I didn't think was legitimate. Uh, well, that didn't fly. But that argument um, gives rise to some concerns that we might have about whether people who are part of rebel organizations that we think of as legitimate um, would face challenges if they came to the United States. If you were a freedom fighter, right, that the line between freedom fighter and terrorist, we say, is sort of, in, you know, oftentimes fraught. If you were part of a group that was uh, really trying to overthrow what you saw as an illegitimate government um, and then came to the U and then asked to come to the U.S., you'd have to answer, yeah, I tried to violently overthrow a government and you might not be allowed in. So, what does that mean for a, a lot of people that are in current situations like Syria, where you've got a lot of different rebel groups, some acting in ways that we might think are noble um, and are meant for the benefit of the country, um, but they advocated the violent overthrow. So these sorts of complexities start to arise when we think about the defenses. Again, not excusing woe you or anyone, but to start to think about what type of broad net do we cast when um, we use this tool, which is rather blunt, to get people who are most responsible for, to get people who we think are responsible for human rights or uh, war crimes. The next set of cases that I've been really concerned about um, are the cases that come out of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So in these cases, the story is that in 2003, an immigration official read a book that mentioned the name of a perpetrator in the Srebrenica genocide. This is considered the worst act of uh, ethnically based violence since World War II. Um, and his name was Marko Boskic, the person who was accused of being a, a, a killer. I mean, actually literally killing people during this genocidal act. And this immigration official sent, decided to look and see, you know, is this person perhaps in the U.S.? And, you know, which people who might have been affiliated with the Srebrenica genocide made their way to the United States? And they asked the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, for their list of members in what is called the VRS. That's basically the, the paramilitary group uh, that represented the Bosnian Serbs. And they got back a list and they cross-checked it with immigration um, databases and saw that there's about 150 uh, individuals, um, I, I hear different words, 150 to 300, right? But so, so on a lower end count, 150 people who were in the United States that were affiliated with this particular uh, military group. And so the, one of the investigators at the ICTY contacted the immigration officials and said, you know, given that all of these people were on this list, it's very likely that we could say that they committed immigration fraud. And he delineated in this memo three levels of culpability. He said, there are people who probably 
committed this act, were part, active participants in this act, and so they would be easiest to show that they committed persecution. Um, there are people who may have known about it, and then there are people who may have not known anything about it. Um, but they were on, they were in this group, they were on this list, they were in this paramilitary group, and they didn't disclose it. And that's going to make it really easy to find that they committed immigration fraud. And so um, dozens of uh, these people have been arrested and put into immigration proceedings. Um, another group uh, were arrested and put into criminal proceedings. And again, as I noted, the outcomes of those criminal proceedings have not been uniform. Some of, the, of those accused were found guilty of immigration fraud. Some were not found guilty of immigration fraud. And their defenses were pretty compelling. One defense that uh, seemed to work was to say, I was on that list, but I have documentation that shows that I was a factory worker. Um, I was never an active participant, um, or I actively tried to desert that particular paramilitary unit. And so I shouldn't be found criminally guilty of committing fraud. It wasn't a material misrepresentation. The defense attorneys for these cases often point out that these immigrants, these um, particular, these Bosnian Serbs, um, they claim they were forcibly conscripted. Um, and they claim that when they were asked the question, and this is what's interesting, if they didn't pull the trigger and if they didn't know about the persecution, what they're being found for committing fraud is based on their answer to the question, were you ever part of a military organization? And the Bosnian Serbs claim that the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, told them to say no. Um, now, because it, you know, precisely because it could lead to further questions that could make them excludable. Now, we might say, oh, well, sure, that's, the, you know, they still, do, they still committed fraud, right? Even if the IOM advised them, and, and can we really be sure the IOM advised them? IOM has not wanted to participate in these criminal proceedings or these immigration proceedings. But even so, one of the arguments is that when asked if you were part of a military organization, is this particular paramilitary group an or a military organization? These people claimed that they were in the military of the former Yugoslavia, but the VRS was part of the Republic, the, the claim, the so-called Republic of Srpska, which really was never a state. So then there, you know, these are sort of the, the, the nuances, right? The challenges um, and the dilemmas. So I've, I've observed several of these immigration hearings with um, some of the Bosnian Serbs that have been accused. And again, this is, this is morally complex because yes, there are people who uh, participated in this genocide and there are others who claim that they themselves were ethnically cleansed and they had nothing to do with this genocide. And that what's happening in these proceedings um, is that they're being tied to the genocide. So in, in court transcripts, um, that I've seen, there's a heavy emphasis on the genocide, which starts to create this guilt by association that these people, as Bosnian Serbs, are now genocidaires, right? And again, it speaks to that earlier concern I mentioned about uh, when you are saying we're uh, accusing them of immigration fraud, but the underlying offense is something as horrific as a genocide, right? We start to think about what these people's uh, what we're actually holding them guilty for, um, and is that is that fair um, both for them, um, but also for thinking about who's really guilty of acts of genocide? Right. Again, international criminal courts have tried to not find lower level uh, perpetrators, and in this case, people who claim that they, if they if, even if they held an arm, you know, some of them say I never even held a gun, or if I did, I ran away, or if I did, I was forced, or right. These are the types of people that international criminal courts have moved away from because they've wanted to show the people who are most responsible. So uh, the other dilemma that I've seen in looking at these cases is that w when we use uh, law to determine guilt or innocence around something as complex as genocide. Uh, group identity forms and group animosity forms. And so the Bosnian Serbs that I spoke with were talking about how they felt at ease with their Bosnian Muslim neighbors in the diaspora and this particular uh, targeting, as they see it, of them as Bosnian Serbs fanned the flames of the ethnic divisions that they had in the former Yugoslavia. And I could see that when I was listening to them talk about Bosnian Muslims. And it was clear that the effort to move away from that and come to the United States and rebuild 
um, as an inter-ethnic diaspora community um, was being undermined, right, by this perception that they were being targeted as Bosnian Serbs. Now, again, there's been a couple, there's actually a few cases of Bosnian Croats and Bosnian Muslims um, that have been um, targeted by this unit and have been deported as well. Uh, and just as in the international criminal, uh, the, the ICTY, the impression is that it's mostly Serbs. And again, that feeds this victim narrative. So again, just some of the complexities involved in this particular effort to use immigration law. So um, what uh, I want to um, turn to um, is just in, in the last few minutes, where we're going with this project. So. Uh, after studying the United States' effort, we decided to look at other countries. And so the United States is not the only country, obviously, using this particular policy. Um, Canada has its own efforts, and the Netherlands was the other case that we looked at. The Netherlands is a particularly interesting um, case to look at because they have focused very much on excluding people um, before they come here. And I'm just going to point to some, you know, key points because I want to wrap it up that we could talk about in Q&A um, is that the Netherlands would appear poised to focus on accountability, right, to actually punish people for, you know, committing atrocities, not focus on exclusion or deportation, but they focus a lot on exclusion and they have the tools to do so. Um, but recently, the Netherlands was challenged in their effort to deport a person who was accused of um, who was accused of uh, participating in uh, violence abroad. Um, the European, uh, the Court of Justice for the European Union issued a ruling in 2018 that the Netherlands actually revisit its exclusion policy because they found the country has to balance security needs with an immigrant's right to freedom of movement. Right, so there's, this is interesting because now there's a human rights check on what is said to be a human rights policy. Right. And so that's as countries get more worried about admitting people who may have committed atrocities abroad, um, the European Court of Justice is starting to step in and say, mm, but what about those people who have created lives in the United States where the evidence of what they did abroad isn't so clear? Um, we might have to balance those different um, those different needs. So um, finally, we're moving in to um, public opinion on these issues, because what we're finding is sort of these dilemmas. And we wanted to know, do US, do people in the US have these concerns too about this? Um, and so we've been, we engaged in a couple of a public opinion experiments uh, last year, um, where a representative sample uh, of, of US voters participated in a survey. And we basically wanted to say, look, what do you think about lying on immigration forms? And does it matter what you lied about? And so this first experiment said, it kind of does matter what you lied about, but what it shows this experiment, and you can you can read it, is that is that American citizens understandably don't like lying. We don't like lying, and you shouldn't get immigration benefits if you lied, even about something um, as uh, as what we might consider minor as education, right? If you lied about your educational status, right? That that matters to people. Um, so then there's also concerns, though, and this is where we're going to be moving with this, about, well, if we're going to exclude people or we're going to deport them, should we be thinking about their level of responsibility in, an, in a military organization or a, or a terrorist organization um, when we think about whether they should get immigration benefits? And it looks that the answer is yes, right? Do we support granting a visa to someone who is somehow affiliated with, this was a question about the Taliban, right? And we have statistically significant differences in whether a person was a dishwasher or a leader. And right now we're developing a code book to, to understand why. So we had open-ended questions. Um, and this is, this is sort of our initial coding to think about, well, why might we think that the dishwasher should be treated differently than the guard or if we think they should be deported no matter what why and these are some of the codes that we've discovered right sort of an automatic link between um, the taliban and terrorism um interestingly you know the we thought that you know this might be a zero you know seen as zero sum give a spot to one person uh, and another person can't get one, but that seems really low. But what we see really high is, you know, these concerns that look, if you're affiliated with this group, you're a bad, you're bad, right? So guilt by association. 
Um, but, but also surprisingly, again, we need more information, right? That these are not easy answers. There are not easy answers to thinking about who should be allowed into the country um, and who should be deported once they get here. And with that, uh, I'm gonna conclu conclude with a shift that's occurring that we need to follow up on. Um, I've, I've been every day thinking I need to email the people who are generous with us at this unit because this unit uh, is, is now, there's a, a new unit that's being created in the Department of Justice under Trump that's focused on denaturalization of immigrants. And so they have used the similar uh, rhetoric about bringing to justice terrorists, war criminals, sex offenders, and other fraudsters. Um, and there's of course concerns that this is even more part of NIMBY politics um, that have taken over our immigration system. So I conclude some of the challenges accountability, due process, and freedom of movement, and how we have to weigh all of these different priorities in human rights law, and the challenges that emerge when we use immigration law to realize human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowan, for joining us and for this presentation. While we're waiting for folks to uh, ask questions, uh, maybe I'll start uh, with a question that I had. Um, mm -hmm. So in, uh, in your research into some of these cases, and especially the way that they've actually practically played out in the United States, um, for instance, um, how have you found sort of the uh, types of evidence that have been brought uh, to bear in these cases? Um, how are they usually collected? Is this information that's being collected abroad? Is it information that's coming mostly from domestic sources? what types of evidence uh, is actually brought forward uh, to link these individuals with uh, past war crimes? Uh, I'm just curious oh, about what great, it looks like. It's a great question. So I'll start with what I saw in the Liberia cases um, and what I heard from, so I interviewed um, about a dozen uh, defense attorneys in these cases to ask, you know, to find out about this. And so, and we've also, you know, we've interviewed um, the, the people at the uh, unit. So there's, several types of evidence that's used. One that is particularly interesting is historical evidence and uh, which is often brought up in international criminal trials as well. Um, and that evidence is to show uh, the sort of nature of violence that occurred. Um, it's, it's particularly challenging because it's hard to get it right. Um, it's especially in the case of Srebrenica there's a lot of conflicting information about which units, which subunits within um, the VRS, this Republic of Srpska paramilitary, were actually responsible for Srebrenica and what the other units were doing. And so I've heard two sides on this issue. I've heard, well, everybody who was in this unit um, was, you know, had some type of complicity or evidence about the different subunits and what they were doing. And then I've heard defense attorneys say that that evidence wasn't correct. And I'm not a historian and I wasn't there. And so there's this challenge of when you're bringing forth this type of evidence, who's actually able to um, make that determination? Certainly not an everyday typical juror and certainly not an immigration judge, right? When we say that this particular person whose name showed up on a list is, a, you know, should be held considered uh, a persecutor, right? Because that's really what we're saying is they lied when they said they weren't part of the group or um, and we're, uh, you know, affiliating them with um, persecution in some ways. The other type of evidence that I have found really striking is what witness testimony. So in this case against Jabate, a, a, a significant number of witnesses were flown from Liberia. This is very expensive, and this is why these cases often don't make it to criminal courts, right? It's the sort of the gold standard would be to put a person in criminal proceedings for committing this type of fraud. Um, but that requires this type of evidence and cross-examination of witnesses to describe atrocities that happened to them a very long time ago. And that, interestingly, is difficult because in most criminal cases, we are really worried about what is called hearsay which is a person talking about something that they didn't directly witness, they just heard about. Um, and we can use that information in many ways, but it can't be for the truth of the matter asserted is what we know about evidence law. And what I noticed when I was watching the Jabate trial was the defense attorney started by challenging some of the witnesses on hearsay and gave up quickly because the judge was letting the evidence in. And 
Uh, then turned to challenging, was basically, you know, challenging the witnesses for suggesting how much they got paid to come to the United States, right? So he was trying to impeach the witnesses based either on their national origin to suggest that they were against Jabate based on their national origin or because they were being paid. Um, either way, it is difficult evidence. And it's certainly difficult for a defense attorney, you know, and, and perhaps rightfully so, to challenge a person who's describing the atrocities they witnessed when they were a child 13 years ago. Um, one of the concerns, again, is that these witnesses, this evidence was collected. One reason the Liberia cases have been able to move forward as the rate they have is there have been people on the ground in Liberia finding witnesses for a decade to participate in these types of trials. They just weren't sure where the trials would be. Would there be a court, you know, in Liberia, an international court? Turns out, no, it turned out it was immigration court in the United States. And so with the NGOs on the ground who found the witnesses um, and prepared them, they were able to connect to the prosecutors who flew to Liberia several times uh, to do interviews themselves. But this again shows you why it's so difficult to prosecute these criminally. It's very expensive. It's it's, it's witness testimony that's difficult to get. There's been efforts to do this witness testimony via Skype, um, and there's all sorts of challenges that get raised about your ability to effectively cross-examine. So that's, that, that's two examples of the type of evidence that's brought to bear and the challenges with it. So we have a, a question from the audience. Um, I'll read it out. How do you think this merger of the criminal and immigration courts has been uh, unethically used to criminalize migrants slash immigrants to the US? It seems concerning when the use of immigration courts, uh, looking to one of your examples, makes testimony that sounds like it could be considered hearsay in a criminal court. Um, I wonder how you feel about the ethics of this merger. And then to follow up, um, when you said the goal of this is to prosecute leaders, how does it make other people vulnerable to deportation? Well, so the goal, I'm gonna start with the latter question. Um, the goal of this is actually not to prosecute leaders. Um, it is easier to prosecute the leaders like we saw with Wowiu and Jabate and Boli. Um, and those are, those are individuals where there's really good documentation about what they did. I often wonder if Jabate would have been found guilty if that picture hadn't been taken um, of him proudly with his rebel group um, that, made it, that you know, made it easier to prove it was him. Um, so, so in that, in those cases, we have leaders, and in the Bosnia cases, we don't have leaders. And so that leads to the first question, which is, um, I appreciate that for a lot of people, these, the, those who are affiliated with the VRS are affiliated with genocide, and that's bad. Um, and I worry about what happens when people are uh, conscripted and forced to do things. Actually, we have another experiment that we're running now about uh, whether you were forcibly a guard in a Taliban camp, for example. Do we think that that matters um, when we talk about whether people deserve immigration benefits? Because the complexity of war means that people get conscripted. It means that people may be, quote, freedom fighters, right? It, it means that it's really difficult to um, delineate who we want to call a war criminal or a human rights violator and who we want to call a victim. That's tough stuff. Um, and so I like the approach. I, I sort of, I lean in the favor of international criminal courts that try to make sure that we're getting the most responsible, though there's a lot of problems there too, a lot. Um, and, I, and I would caution about how wide a net we throw because it's easier to get certain people that we have documentation of. That group of Bosnians, it was easier to get them um, because they were on that list. And those you know, there's a lot of other people who committed atrocities. So we just need to be cognizant of that and mindful of that and thoughtful about it. Um, yeah. So um, another question from the audience. Uh, well done. Just a point of clarification. Once the government raises the persecutor bar, the burden shifts to the individual in proceedings to show that he or she is not subject to the persecutor bar. Also, many times, substantive criminal statutes cannot be used in these cases due to the ex post facto provisions of our constitution? Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that question. It's from uh, the person who knows the most about this particular unit. Um, and that's exactly what, I mean, I hope I tried, to, I, I hope I conveyed in the beginning of the talk, which is that it is really not possible um, in many cases to use our criminal laws to get at the underlying crime. So we have to use immigration law. And so again, when we talk about accountability, 
um, we just need to be aware that we're holding people accountable for immigration fraud, but really it's for the, there's this underlying offense issue. We need to think about, well, what does that mean for people like Boley who get deported and then become legislators? Um, and so, you know, I, I do think that it's, it's good if we're worried about impunity and accountability to have other tools at our disposal. Um, and then it's also important to um, be clear about uh, which people we think we should be targeting. Um, and I appreciate that point of clarification about the persecutor bar. That's a, a, a important legal point as well. Um, another question from our audience. Uh, is there any provision given to people who didn't feel they lied on their immigration forms, such as by not having an understanding of what genocide military organization uh, means congruent with the US justice system? Right. So the only way to really get at that question is to is is in transcripts. And so the bully case, I think, gives a really the, the bully case. There they weren't transcripts, but there was actually a, a daily um, civitas maxima um, did a were trial monitors. And so I, the defense arguments talk about exactly this point. Um, and, I'll, and what I've heard when I speak to the Bosnian Serbs who are in immigration proceedings and the defense attorneys. Right. Absolutely, you can raise all of this that you want. Um, you can raise it as much as you want. Um, the problem is that when a jury, if we're using a criminal trial, is hearing about atrocities that you're affiliated with, they don't care if you knew what the word genocide meant, right? And they don't, and, and, and your understanding of persecution, if it was justified to you because you think somehow you were in, in, in a war that was justified, or in the case of woe we you, you didn't try to violently overthrow a government because you didn't think that really was a government, right? That was that was valid, right? You can raise that as the defense attorney or as the defendant, but the jury is looking at this underlying, these underlying acts, right? And so there's a bit of what we try to avoid in normal criminal courts of character evidence, right? There's, we don't want people to be held guilty for being bad people. And that is extremely easy in a case like this. It is probably the easiest case I've ever heard of, of holding people accountable for being bad people when you're talking about these types of atrocities. It doesn't matter if they tech, understand the technicalities of the legal terms. Um, so a question, another question from our audience. Uh, thank you for doing this talk and understanding this research. Seeing the evolution of using immigration tools to seek justice for war crimes what do you think is coming next? Will we see expansion of these tools and greater acceptance of this approach or limitations in this approach in light of immigration becoming a more polarized political issue? Well, as I showed in my last slide that we have a new department in the, uh, a new unit in the Department of Justice, uh, it, I think it really depends on uh, what happens with that unit. Um, the person who, who's rumored to head that unit actually prosecuted one of these cases. Um, and I worry because uh, there's all different types of misrepresentations that can go on in immigration form. And so if we are committed to making sure that people who are actually terrorists or war criminals or human rights violators in some other sense are, uh, are deported, right? We'll focus on them. But if we're committed to thinning out people in this country, um, we might be able to use these same tools for a much broader dragnet. Um, are there any last questions from the audience? And I'm available um, by email jrowan at umass.edu. Um, this is an ongoing project and um, we're happy to, to learn about what other people are working on or to get feedback or answer questions. Thank you so much. So again, Dr. Rowan, on behalf of our Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies, and the Todman Center for American Politics and Policy. We are really pleased to have had you here today for this really interesting discussion. And uh, we will eventually have you back in person uh, once we're able to do that here at Brown University. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. And thank, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining today. Uh, please stay safe and stay healthy and look to our website uh, for the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies for further upcoming events that we have uh, via the virtual Zoom platform over this next month. Thank mm -hmm. you.